The 20th century was dominated by delusions of passive progress. And I would say that in the 21st century, we have yet to replace these delusions with a more pragmatic notion of how progress will actively be achieved. I was gonna do a day in my life, so I was showing everything that wasn't Jewish. So this was something else. You did hashtag Jew talk, Jew Israeli, talk. Rosh Hashanah, fish head, mm -hmm. and traditions. Yeah, because this is like, people don't know why you have a fish head at Rosh Hashanah and, and so forth. Were you disappointed we didn't have a fish head? I was so sad yeah, in the I pomegranates. No one knew Hebrew. I was ready to speak Hebrew with people. I was like so excited about it and it just didn't happen. So you did this one here. I love Jew talk is now your most common. It's popular. I got free falafels here for wearing an Israel shirt. Okay, this is the one I had a problem with. Okay. Now, now Trisha, <laughs> you know you can't, you says rating my Jew lunch. Uh-huh. Do you not see what's the problem with that? I couldn't fit ish in there. But Jew is like a derogative. No. My Jew lunch. I think it's the way if you say it. I was writing like, oh, my Jew lunch. I can tell you with 100% uh, with certainty you cannot say that. It's offensive. Moses said it was fine and he is from Israel and had a bar mitzvah. I also saw Israeli matzah meal and I got really excited because it said Israeli. And hey, my boyfriend's Israeli. So I really love them and I love you guys. If you're Israeli, like shout out. I love you guys so much. I also saw these chocolates with these cute little kids on the box. And I was like, oh, we need to get them. And I saw even more chocolates. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. My Israelis know what's up. The Jews really love their chocolates. So I also got this chocolate cereal that has some milky milk in it, which is really cool. The Jews also love wafers, which who would have known? What's in it? And the vegetables. Oh my god. It's vegan, 100% vegetable. Really? Yeah. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> I don't know how to say that in Hebrew, but I know some things, I just don't know that. <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. I'm sure you've guessed by now that this is a serious video about a serious topic. And if you found yourself laughing at the first minute and a half, ask yourself why. And what it is exactly you're laughing at, what it is that's so awkward, or perhaps so offensive, or so disturbing, about what you've just seen. Isn't it possible that when we look at Trisha Paytas, in her attempts to appropriate Jewish culture, we're actually looking at the best case scenario for the future of Judaism, of Jewishness, and of anti-Semitism? That maybe the best thing we can hope for is that this just comes to be regarded as another normal culture in the same sense that South Korean culture or Japanese culture, it's, it's just another culture. Hate crimes against Jews have increased by nearly a third since 2010, according to the Home Affairs Select Committee report, and the volume and viciousness of online abuse is unprecedented. It's all news that comes as no surprise to the community. We will get calls from visibly Jewish people, whether it's in London, North Manchester, Gateshead, Leeds, other places, who tell us that on a regular basis, when they walk to and from synagogue, they get abuse shouted at them by people on street corners, by people from passing cars. They may get stones or coins thrown at them. And for too many people, this is something they feel they have to put up with because it's just part of being Jewish. The report shows an 11% rise in anti-Semitic incidents in the first half of this year compared to 2015. It also shows the number of people in Britain with anti-Semitic attitudes rose by 50% in just 12 months. And as many as 1 in 20 adults in the UK could now be characterised as clearly anti-Semitic. Daniel and Theo are barely in their teens, children who say they've had vicious hate shouted at them by grown men. We were getting onto a bus and a car was driving by and seeing as we were wearing our suits and our kippah on our head, um, the car slowed down and shouted, F you Jewish. I was just thinking, why do they feel that way just because we're Jewish? I just felt it was unfair. In the same way that Trisha Paytas has just gotten enthusiastic about both Jewishness and the state of Israel specifically, and has started kind of collecting Jewish stuff and wearing pro-Israel t-shirts, Every day, there are white guys who get a Japanese girlfriend and start, you know, becoming fascinated with and clothing themselves with Japanese culture, going to Japanese markets, eating Japanese food, so on and so forth. Does this really represent something negative or is there something more important for us to examine in the negative public reaction to this example? And if you want to reply by claiming 
that the state of Israel is in a uniquely terrible political position. Well, no, it's not unique, is it? It could indeed be said that Israel is a war-torn country in a strange sort of Cold War situation with its neighbors. So is South Korea. There are many countries and many cultures all over the world that are in a war-torn, politically fraught situation. Israel isn't unique. We make it unique because of the expectations that we place on Israel because of this very strange exceptionalism that's applied to Judaism and Jewishness, even if in practice this is a form of racism, that it falls under the heading of ethnic politics, I would say that this problem is, in principle, political. How do you think your Jewish heritage impacts your vision of the world and politics? And do you think it is a help or a hindrance to your role as a candidate? The American Jewish community experienced the highest level of anti-Semitic incidents last year since tracking began in 1979, with more than 2,100 acts of assault, vandalism, and harassment reported across the United States. The total number of anti-Semitic incidents in 2019 increased 12% over the previous year, with a disturbing 56% increase in assaults. Jews were the target of most religion-based hate crimes in 2018. Nearly 60% of hate crime attacks were targeted against Jews and Jewish institutions in 2018. In 2018, hate crime murders totaled 24, the highest since the FBI began tracking and reporting on hate crimes in 1991. The increase is attributable to 2018, having seen the deadliest anti-Semitic hate crime in American history, when 11 worshippers were murdered in the three congregations meeting at the Tree of Life Synagogue building in Pittsburgh. People like Louis Farrakhan, who called Jews satanic, bloodsuckers, and termites, are allowed to spew their vitriol on Twitter and Instagram. He has 348,000 followers on Twitter. If Bernie Sanders is elected, he would be our first Jewish American president. As a Jewish American, that would be a huge step forward in this country and blow back against the rise of anti-Semitism in this country. Uh, as far as the, uh, as far as the uh, alt-right anti-Semitism, I mean, as somebody who received an inordinate amount of hate from the alt-right in the last year, uh, the Anti-Defamation League named me the number one recipient of anti-Semitic tweets for journalists on the internet last year. Uh, and that was largely driven by uh, the, the alt-right. Um, I think that people need to understand what the alt-right actually is and people who think they're alt-right. So not everybody who likes memes is an alt-right person, okay? I think a lot of these, I think a lot of memes are hilarious. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm particularly fond of the Harambe memes. So I'm, there, there are a lot of these things that I think are really funny. Uh, but I think that the alt-right did a, a good marketing thing when they broadened their appeal. Because the actual basis of the alt-right movement, people like Jared Taylor and Richard Spencer, is, is essentially a, a white supremacist argument uh, that, the, that the white race created Western civilization and that outsiders to that race are threats to Western civilization. Uh, and I think that the rise of, of that movement uh, is partially driven a, as a reaction to the intersectionality theory of the left. Any Jewish people that vote for a Democrat, I think it shows either a total lack of knowledge or great disloyalty. You know, they were chanting like in Charlottesville. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us and then having a Jew literally replace them would be like, that would be so satisfying. You also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Tonight, a neo-Nazi in Pennsylvania, a small rural town near the New York border, splitting apart by a growing movement filled with hate. The man at the center of it says Trump's election has emboldened him and his followers. It is definitely a difficult time to be Jewish right now, considering the Trump administration's anti-Semitism and there's been a spike in hate crimes and Nazi empowerment. So on the left, you've seen the, the, this, this attempt to basically paint everybody in the United States as a member of a particular race or sex or sexual orientation. They're not individuals, they're groups. And all of these groups have been victimized by Western civilization and therefore they have to stand up and fight back against Western civilization. And there's a group of people on the so-called alt-right who aren't particularly conservative, by the way. They're not in favor of smaller government, many of them. Right. Many of them are overtly anti-Christian, not just anti-Judaic. Uh, and they come along and they say, okay, well, if intersectionality is good for the left, why can't it be good for the right? right? Why can't we have, uh, why can't this be true for white people? Right? If there's an interest group for black people, why not have an interest group for white people? And I think that that's, uh, the, the, that reactionary tendency gained some steam during the last election cycle. And, uh, and because they consider themselves to be politically incorrect more than just wrong, uh, yeah. they, they glom on to a person they consider to be politically incorrect, which is President Trump. Now, I grew up in Austria. I'm very aware of Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. It was a night of rampage against the Jews carried out in 1938 by the Nazi equivalent of the Proud Boys. 
I grew up in the ruins of a country that suffered the loss of its democracy. My father's family was wiped out by Hitler in the Holocaust. I know about what crazy and radical and extremist politics mean. I learned that lesson as a tiny, tiny child when my mother would take me shopping and we would see people working in stores who had numbers on their arms because they were in Hitler's concentration camp. I am very proud of being Jewish and that is an essential part of who I am as a human being. What we are seeing right now, we're seeing it in America and we're seeing it all over the world, is a rise in anti-Semitism. We're seeing people being stabbed in New York City because they were Jewish. If there was ever a time in American history where we say no to religious bigotry, this is the time. If there is any people on earth who understands the danger of racism and white nationalism, it is certainly the Jewish people. This is not my normal content. As some of you know, I am Jewish. If you didn't know that, Surprise! I've also recently decided to try my hand at making TikToks, which is when I made the discovery that TikTok is a very shitty place to be if you're Jewish. So how did I make that discovery? Well, one day I was just sitting around and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna make a goofy little TikTok about what it's like to be Jewish on social media. And the response to that TikTok was interesting. Let me show you the TikTok. I see a lot of people doing their, you know, social media activism, but when it comes to speaking out against anti-Semitism, those same people are completely silent. So this was just like my way of playfully poking fun at the hypocrisy. If I had to guess why people don't want to speak out against anti-Semitism and in some cases why they make anti-Semitic comments online, I would say it's probably for one of the following reasons. A, they incorrectly assume that all Jews are privileged and therefore don't need allyship and support. B, they're afraid of the backlash which is, you know, understandable. A lot of people have some very unhealthy and uneducated beliefs about Jewish people. C, they actually just don't like Jewish people. D, they simply do not give a shit. Or E, they're trolling. This is where I want to step into the video and disagree with her productively. Because if I were to make a numbered list of what the problems are and what the solutions are that they hint at implicitly out of a very different set of concerns leading to a very different set of conclusions. A large percentage of people, I don't know the percentage, but a very large percentage of people are simultaneously fascinated by and terrified of this idea that there are secret clubs that hold political power over them. That somewhere there's a meeting of special people who discuss what Parliament is really going to do, what the Senate or Congress is really going to do, or what City Hall is going to do. And it is the abstract idea of this possibility, not the reality of the political process in the country they're living in, that they're fascinated by, and that breeds these hysterical conspiracy theories. And let me tell you something. There are clubs that you can join today where members of the social and political elite meet to discuss the future of your city, your province, your state, your country. The Empire Club of Canada in Toronto has an open door. They have a website, I think they have a YouTube channel where they upload these lectures. And if you join, if you pay a couple hundred dollars here and there, you can attend special lectures given by the mayor, given by members of parliament, given by influential lawyers and leaders of public opinion, here in Victoria, BC, Canada, it's the capital of this province, the Union Club was the best example I could come up with. If you take a moment to look around, probably in the city you're living in, or in the country you're living in, there are clubs of this kind. And if you tried to get involved positively, you might be shocked at just how easy it is to participate and why because so few people care. Because the reality is they have meetings where members of this political elite come together to discuss what should happen next at Parliament, at Congress, at City Hall, or even in foreign policy or in economic planning, and nobody shows up unless they're paid to. And 
even when they pay, even when they pay a lot of money for someone with a PhD from the university to come and give a presentation, you'd be shocked and horrified at how little sincere interest there is in the future of our democracy. You'd be shocked at the extent to which these elites are voluntary in terms of their participation, that they're just comprised of whoever it is that wants to dedicate the time to really show an interest in the future of their polity. Very striking illustrative example here of a young woman. Uh, she was a university student in California who became an influential and important person in American politics just by showing up. She didn't have money. She didn't have connections. She didn't have a conspiracy behind her. And right now there's an investigation. There's a suspicion that she was doing this in order to spy on the United States of America on behalf of the government of China. But we don't know that. That's just a theory. That's just an allegation. We don't know that. What did she actually do? Well, there were these meetings for mayors in the United States of America, for municipal level government to get together and have a meeting. And guess what? Just like the elite clubs I alluded to before, just like the Empire Club of Canada and so on, anyone can show up. And she showed up. So she got to sit down at the table with and talk to and theoretically lobby or influence mayors and then later congressmen and then later senators. She had no qualifications. She was a uh, member of the Asian Pacific Islander Association of her university. And as the text says on screen, she used this, um, I don't know, as her business card. She used this to get her foot in the door just to say she had some reason to be there, some reason to talk to these people. She showed up. You can show up too. You can participate in the democratic forums in your country. You know what the truth is? Even if you live in a country that is not a democracy, you would be amazed. You would be amazed at how many public consultations there are, how many forums there are, how many opportunities there are for people to show up and at least hear what people in government have to say. If not, chit-chat with them, inform them. How many social forums of this kind there are going on behind the scenes every day? The people who think this way take zero interest in political power themselves. They have zero interest in participating in the political process themselves. They have zero interest in the actually existing clubs of this kind. And then reciprocal with that mentality is this over-the-top hysteria about Jews and Jewishness in specific. And you will find that those same hysterical attitudes can be applied and are applied just as readily to the idea of a Russian conspiracy existing behind the scenes in the United States of America, to the idea of a Chinese conspiracy existing behind the scenes in the United States of America. And the way to overcome this is both to make the real political process more transparent, more democratically accountable, and to give people a higher level of education so they know precisely how boring the reality is of participating in that democratic or undemocratic political process. Yeah, Super famous Wonder Woman lady, oh yeah, Gal get Miss Israel, super beautiful woman, no oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Gal get is a wonderful, beautiful woman, no oh, yes. Fast and Furious movies She's a Justice League woman The 20th century was dominated by delusions of passive progress. And I would say that in the 21st century, we have yet to replace these delusions with a more pragmatic notion of how progress will actively be achieved. What do I mean by passive progress? The idea that passively people all over the world will get less and less racist with the passage of time 
And why? Just because, just because there's some invisible force like gravity pulling people down to Earth that's just going to make people less racist, less mutually invidious with the passage of time. No particular government program is going to force this to happen. No particular decision made democratically or undemocratically. No particular direction taken on by education. Just the passage of time itself would result in the whole world becoming one, more secular, two, more scientific in their attitudes, three, more mutually accepting and mutually appreciative. I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that there were more and more Chinese restaurants in downtown New York City. People had the delusion that this alone would bring about a golden age of, um, I don't know, the unification of all peoples and all cultures around the world. It's not going to happen unless you force it to happen. And I do think, I'm Jewish myself, I do think that Judaism and Jewishness has played this unique catalyst's role in the Western reappraisal of what the nation state is supposed to be, what the future of nationalism is, and what the future of ethnicity is supposed to be. This is not only because of the Holocaust. This is the most examined chapter of the story. It also has to be pointed out more broadly, the Jews themselves, already during the French Revolution, were perceived as in some ways the most secular, most atheistic, most cosmopolitan part of the population. In the 20th century, it's fair to say that the idea of what an American Jew looked like and how they spoke and acted was someone like Jerry Seinfeld. And someone like Jerry Seinfeld is a cosmopolitan, secular, if not overtly atheist, a modern, leading-edge, uh, supposedly intelligent sort of guy. That's the image of supposedly who Jews are and what they represent. And now if you just take five minutes to look at the demographics of the modern state of Israel, you're going to see not only is this not true, it's not the direction the state of Israel is going in. The percentage of Israeli Jews who are religious, who are extremely religious, who are Haredis, the percentage of the state of Israel who look and act and sound and think nothing like Jerry Seinfeld, but who fall into a very different category, and who relate to the ongoing peace process of the Palestinians and changing foreign policy led by Jared Kushner and reconciliation with neighboring Arab states, who relate to those global and local politics in a profoundly different way that we profoundly can't understand, the delusion of the 20th century was that all of these problems would just passively disappear. And from the other side, anti-Semitism would disappear because the delusion was the masses of Christians in the world, the masses of Muslims in the world, were going to catch up with Jerry Seinfeld. That just passively scientific, cosmopolitan, secular attitudes were going to blossom for no reason at all. say this is a bit like the delusion of passive effortless weight loss. You've got to look in the mirror at some point and say nothing is going to change unless I change it. Unless I really make a commitment to not just try harder but to really suffer. Right? <laughs> That's when you're going to lose weight. That's when you're going to get in shape. Nothing is going to change culturally or religiously unless we commit to a kind of transformation personally, individually, politically, culturally, on a larger scale, that's going to entail terrible suffering. And yes, it is probably going to entail the government making very hard decisions that will be bitterly protested against by people who you know, value their own religion more or value their ethnicity more than the future of having a genuinely pluralistic democracy where these people sit at one table, they're educated in one school, and they debate the future of their country in one and the same parliament. As equals. You can say I'm a Jew from Israel, but you can't use Jew as an adjective. Like Jew lunch sounds yeah. fucked up. People can say they're a Jew and I can't say Jew lunch. Hey, I'm like promoting this like culture. Yeah, but you're kind of like, uh, this is kind of like cultural appropriation, isn't it? Appreciation. Right. Okay. That's the. I think it is. So many Israelis will like be like, thank you so much for like, you know, speaking Hebrew. Like a lot of people like say thank you for it. And I mean, there's some that hate it, but. 
There um, are some that hate it. Would you get hate comments? Yeah, I mean, there's certain people that are like, what do they say? I mean, that's more just like people who say free Palestine. They get pissed off, but I don't know. Oh, it's not the Jews that get angry. No, it's, it's the, the American Jews that get angry, which aren't real Jews. You're like, what? It's like, calm down. You're from Ventura, California. <laughs> like, you know, you don't know the no. struggle. At the start of this video, I talked about the possibility with Trisha Paytas as my somewhat amusing example. The possibility that the best case scenario for the future of Judaism and Jewishness would be for it to come to be regarded just as a culture, just another culture in the world, no more remarkable than, and maybe no less remarkable than, Japanese culture or South Korean culture. Just being a culture that someone like Trisha Paytas could become enthusiastic about. Now let's all pause for a minute and think about why that's not going to happen or why it's not going to happen during my lifetime, all right? Anti-Semitism is reciprocal with Christianity. Anti-Semitism is reciprocal with Islam. The other part of the delusion of passive progress was just that Muslim people were going to give up being Muslim, Christians were going to give up being Christians, and even under communism in Eastern Europe, in Russia, the Ukraine, Poland, we can see that's not true. That didn't happen at all. Today, it's not just that Christianity has been revived in Eastern Europe. Anti-Semitism has been revived along with it. Anti-Semitism and a fascination with Judaism, the assumption that Jews are some kind of special, exceptional people in the history of the world and in the future of the world, that mentality of Jewish exceptionalism is hardwired into Christianity as a religion and Christian culture. It is hardwired into Islam and Muslim culture to an unbelievable extent. There's a sense in which we can never achieve this future. We can never achieve this ideal of the whole world having attitudes as sophisticated as Trisha Paytas, which is to say, not terribly sophisticated at all. We can't even achieve that unless or until we overcome Christianity and Islam. In other words, we're going to have a problem with anti-Semitism for as long as we have a culture dominated by the Judeo-Christian religions. Ultimately, the Bible is a book about Jews, written by and for Jews, and paradoxically, it provides the basis for two of the largest, most powerful, and most intensely anti-Semitic religions of the world, namely Christianity and Islam. Talk boss featuring words that kill. My slang is editorial, explicit material. Briefcase show, live and stereo flow. Feel me, daughter realty, set the black people free. And that's what it's all about, you know. Everyone will always have something to say about any issue.